Math 265A, Quest to College, I'm Joe Vasta, and today we are covering 3.6 derivatives as rates of change. So, pose a bug. So, number one, suppose a bug is moving on a number line and S of t is its position from the origin in meters. So, now we're using meters after t days. What does ds dt represent? So, look at this. going to go ahead and draw this. We have time, which is measured in days, and position, which is measured in meters. So remember what the derivative does. Um, the derivative of a graph like this will create a rate and it always puts the y-axis so look we have in this case it's the f, the s-axis over the x-axis which is the t-axis so this right here ds dt is always going to be a rate. So it is the rate and we're going to go ahead and put these units over those units. That's what derivatives will always do. It's always rise over run. That's how we derived it. So the ds dt is the rate meters per day. And by the way, meters per day is a velocity. Now, will the derivative always be instantaneous velocity? No, that was our pet example. And we kind of used it here. I switched it to meters and days just so we, you can see that you can switch those around. But it is not always going to be a velocity as you will see in the next few examples. Okay, so problem number two. Suppose B of T is the number of bacteria in a dish after a certain time, T, measured in hours. What does DB DT represent? So what I like to do, because I'm a picture person, is to sort of draw, not function b because I don't know what it is, but I'm going to draw these axes. And I can see that it's always going to be the one that's on the bottom is the x-axis. So this is t, and t is measured in hours. And then this axis here is the y-axis, but we'll call it b. Um, and that is the number of bacteria. So this is, I'll just say bacteria. What does db dt represent? db dt is the rates. So these are always going to be rates. And then you're going to put this, whatever is represented on the y-axis, over whatever is represented on the x-axis. So db dt is the rate bacteria per hour. And so you could be a biologist studying this. And the derivative is going to be helpful to you because you're studying um, the rate of the bacteria per hour. You could be doing lots of stuff with derivatives, not just studying velocity. So that's how 
I look at these problems. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at problem number three. A manufacturer produces toasters. The cost of producing X toasters is C of X dollars. Let's go ahead and draw this in terms of the axes. So look what we have here. You have the X axis because that's the input and X is toasters. Or you, sometimes people will say unit, you know, how many units, how many toasters. X is toasters, and the Y axis is C, which is measured in dollars. What does DC DX represent? Well, it's a rate, so let's write that down. DC DX is the rate of something. And what is the rate going to be measured in? It's always, you take those units, which is dollars, and then put it over this. Dollars per toaster or dollars per unit if you'd like. I'm just going to say dollars per toaster. And that is what DC DX is. It's that rate dollars per toaster. So what do we have here? We have interpret. Okay, so these ones are always scary. Interpret the derivative. Okay, so this is C prime. 500 equals 9. So 500 is going to represent, that's the X, toasters. So let's just say that. At 500 toasters, comma, what does this 9 represent? It doesn't represent like just cost. It is the rate of change. It's the dollars per toaster. So at 500 toasters, the cost is increasing. So see that? The cost is increasing by $9 per toaster. So I'm going to write that down. The cost is increasing. Now, now, how do we know increasing? Because that is a positive number. By how much? Um, Nine dollars per toaster. In terms of making these toasters. So I'm going to box that. That's the interpretation. And in math, we usually don't like these kind of problems, but these are problems that kind of tie things to the real world. Um, let's think about this. If you've had this um, company and you just wanted to produce five toasters, the cost is probably increasing by probably higher than nine dollars per toaster because you are getting things set up and buying things and getting it working but by the time you get up to 500 toasters you probably have it down you, you probably know what you're doing and you've got some machinery bought and you know for each toaster it's increasing nine dollars per toaster okay. and so I know we don't have any graphs of this we just wanted to um, do the first three problems asking you know what does this derivative represent to show you mainly that the derivative is not always going to be 
the velocity. Now, having said that, problem number four, which has like 10 parts to it, is going to involve velocity. Because in your homework, you have, you know, like some things like this, but you have a lot of velocity problems. So let's go ahead and do problem number four. It's different than the bug on the number line. But because we've done the bug on the number line, we can get through section 3.6 with more efficiency because we know a lot of things. Okay, so suppose a stone is thrown vertically upward from the edge of a cliff on earth. Okay, so what does that look like? You are on a cliff, you have a stone in your hand, and it says you throw it vertically upward. So it gets vertically upward, and then, and then there's the ground down here. There's always the ground in these physics problems. Okay. Stone is thrown vertically upward from the edge of a cliff on Earth. The height in feet of the stone above the ground, t seconds after it is thrown, is given by this. So this is the height function, or you could actually still call it the position function. And so what are they asking in part A? They say, what is the velocity and the acceleration after t seconds? Basically, what they want you to find is the velocity function and the acceleration function. So how are we going to find those functions? Well, to find the velocity function, you have to take the derivative. And so that's what I'm going to do. The derivative of s, so you can call it s prime if you'd like, I'm just going to call it v, v of t, and then we know all the shortcuts now. So this is going to be negative 32 t, okay, from the power rule there, and then we have plus 40, and then plus 0, which I'm not going to write. So there's the velocity function. And now, let's find the acceleration function. The acceleration is the derivative of the velocity, a of t. Or if you like, s double prime. Or v prime, but you know, there's a lot of things we can say. And what is the derivative of, of this right here? Well, it's negative 32 plus 0, so this is negative 32. So there's the acceleration. The acceleration is constant. When you throw something up in the air, the change of velocity is always changing in a negative fashion, okay? Because it wants to come back down to the Earth due to gravity. And so this is due to gravity, a gravity constant. So that's what we have here. So now they're going to ask some follow up questions, and they ask, this question here. What is the velocity and the acceleration after one second? Okay, well let's see what we have. What we want to do to do this problem is this right here is t. And they want to know what v of t, v of 1 is. So here it goes, v of 1 that is negative 32 plus 40. So the velocity after one second happens to be 8. And our units on this one are what? Feet and seconds. So this is 8 feet per second. The acceleration after one second, a of one, well look, it's just a constant, it's negative 32 feet per second squared. So there's the acceleration. The acceleration is always going to be that. Now, I've actually graphed this position function. 
Here it is. So after one second, it's pretty high. This tells you the height. But after one second, the slope is a positive 8. Now it might not look like positive 8 because the scaling on the S axis is different than the scaling on the T axis. But the slope at that point is positive 8. Okay, and the acceleration is negative 32. Well, we're not going to talk about what second derivative of a graph means, but it has something to do with concavity, whatever that means. We'll learn about that later. What is the velocity and acceleration after two seconds? So I want to go V of 2 and A of 2. V of 2 is negative 32 times 2 plus 40. So negative 32 times 2 is negative 64. Negative 64 plus 40 is negative 24. And the units on that are feet per second. The acceleration after two seconds, it's just, you put two into that function, negative 32 feet per second squared. And so looking back at our graph at t equals two, you're right there. And the slope is actually steeper, but the slope is negative, and it's negative 24. And once again, it doesn't look like negative 4 on 24 on this graph because the scaling is different, but it's a negative slope at 2. Let's continue with this problem. So this is, this is going to be problem part D. How tall is the cliff? Okay, so what I've done for these problems is I went ahead and I put S, V, and A at the top. So here's the position or the height. Here's the velocity. And then here's the acceleration. So how tall is the cliff? What is the initial velocity? So maybe you can pause the video and see if you can figure out the answer to these questions. How tall is the cliff? So I kind of drew the cliff right here. So we want to know how tall it is. We would like to know the height of the cliff. To find the height of the cliff, that's right when the stone is thrown. So that would be at time zero. We can plug that into the height function and see how tall the cliff is. Okay, because right at zero, that's where it's going to start. So T is zero. We're going to put it into the height function or the position function. So this is S of 0. It's negative 16 times 0 squared plus 40 times 0 plus 96. So what does that look like? It gives us, it gives us 96 and the um, units happen to be feet. So the cliff is 96 feet. What is the initial velocity? Initial means the beginning velocity at which the stone was thrown. Well, right at the beginning, that is when time is zero. And instead of plugging that into the height function, we plug it into the velocity function. And so V of zero will give me the initial velocity. So this is negative 32 times zero plus 40. 
the initial velocity of the stone is 40 feet per second. Now, looking back at our picture of the height of the stone, um, this is this says 10, 20, 30, so here's 90 and here's 100. And so how tall is the cliff? We got that to be 96, which happens to be the S intercept. And the velocity, the initial velocity there, it's a positive slope. We ended up getting the slope is 40. And once again, let me remind you, maybe for a third time, that the scaling on the S axis is different than the T axis. So even though you might not think the slope is 40 there, if I made the scaling the same, well, then we wouldn't be able to see nice aspects of this, but it would have a slope of 40 right there at that time zero. So you could say that right here for D and E, it was time is zero, T is zero, S is 96, and V is 40. I'll write that down. I mean, it's really not needed, but I'm gonna write it down here. So this is T is zero, S is 96. I won't put the units. And then V is 40. Okay, so that's, those two problems kind of went together. And of course we could say what was the initial acceleration, but the acceleration is always going to be negative 30 feet per second squared, so they didn't ask that. Let's go ahead and do the next problem. And somehow on, on this sheet I forgot to write down the functions. So you know what I'll do? I'll just use the last sheet so I don't have to write them down. And here is problem F. When does the stone reach its highest point? And problem G, what is the height of the stone at the highest point? Wow, so maybe we can take a look at our picture again. It's kind of a cheap picture. The highest point is right there. The highest point is not when time equals zero, but it's when something else equals zero. Well, the highest point happens to be, when it reaches there, it's not going up and it's not going down at that very point. So the velocity is zero at that highest point. So we're gonna say, V is zero. So it says, when does the stone reach its highest point? Well, we know the velocity is zero, so we're gonna go to the equation that has the velocity. I'll write it down. V equals negative 32 T plus 40. And then I'm gonna plug in zero for V. So zero equals negative 32t plus 40, and then we have 32t equals 40, t equals 40 over 32. Eight goes into each of those, so eight goes into 45 times, eight goes into 32 four times. If you did that on the calculator or you just thought about it, it would be one point two five seconds. So when does the stone reach its highest point? At 1.25 seconds. What is the height of the stone at the highest point? Well now they're asking for the height, which is really S at the highest point, you know at the highest point that the time is 1.25. So I'm gonna go ahead and write down the S equation. So that's what we're gonna use now. Oh, 
Okay. And so now I know, I, I know what the time is. It's 1.25. And I'm going to plug that in here. And I'm actually going to plug the 5 fourths in here because um, I don't have a calculator nearby. I don't think I do. I could probably try to look for it. And so I could go S of 5 fourths, however you want to do it. But we're solving for S. And I have negative 16 5 fourths squared plus 40 5 fourths plus 96. Now this would work if you had a calculator and you just plug that in and see what it is. But I guess today I'm being a purist. So this is negative 16. We have 25 over 16. Okay, I do like that because the 16s will go away. And then we have plus, look at this, the, um, the 40 and the 4 cancel. So this is a 1 and a 10. So it looks like it says plus 50 plus 96. So S equals negative 25, that's that first thing, plus 50, plus 96. And so 50 minus 25 is 25, so I'm going to go 96 plus 25 off to the right hand side, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so it looks like 121. This is 121. And it's a height? Feet. And good thing it was 121 feet because we found in um, the last problem the height of the cliff was 96. So the highest point should be higher than 96 because the um, stone was thrown upward. So it's 121 feet. To summarize like what I did over here, over here we had the velocity equals zero time equals 1.25 and position is 121. And I'll put that in a cloud. You don't need to write that. F and G, those problems, they kind of go together. It's when the velocity is zero. The other thing that I want to do is I want to show you the picture of what is happening when the velocity is zero. It's at 1.25 seconds. 1.25, 1 and a fourth is right here, which reaches the highest point. If I drew a tangent on that highest point, that would have a slope of zero. So that's the velocity. And we found the height to be, what did we find the height to be? 121. And that's what it looks like. Here's 120 and 121 looks just a little above that. So this graph does show lots of characteristics when you throw the stone up. And it kind of tracks the height of the stone really. Now in your homework, you won't have to generate a graph. Um, one other thing that I want to say is that your book, I better say it now or I might get lots of emails. So your book, when they report seconds, sometimes they'll go like this. They'll go 1.25 and then they'll put a little s there. So. Uh, when I don't say this in lecture, people have been known to like email me or ask questions like, I don't know what they're doing. They put little s's after their answers and what they're doing is they're saying seconds, but they're saying we're even lazier than Vasta Vasta. Um, just uses three letters. We use one letter. Yes. Okay, let's go ahead and do the next pair of problems on this. And um, I think this time I, I wrote the functions on the top. I don't know what happened with that other page. So here's the, the functions for the height. We've been calling this position, the velocity, and the acceleration. 
So now they ask this interesting question, when does the stone strike the ground? Okay, where is our picture? It's a terrible picture actually, but the stone strikes the ground right there. Okay, when the stone strikes the ground, we're always going to call the ground level height zero. Okay, so it's not time zero, it's not velocity zero, but right as it's striking the ground, it's going to be the height or the position is zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, when does the stone strike the ground? That's, that would be when S is zero. So if you look back at our problems, you know, the one was T is zero and we were trying to find the other two. And then the last two was V is zero and we were trying to find the other two. And now this is S is zero and we're trying to find when, which is time. And what velocity does the stone strike the ground? That's going to be V. So you might pause the video and see if you can find these numbers on your own or not. Here it goes. So here's my S function. S equals negative 16 T squared plus 40 T plus 96. Okay, so S is zero, I'm putting zero in for that. So zero equals negative 16 T squared plus 40 T plus 96. Okay, I believe eight. Does eight go into 96? Boy, I should really just find my calculator. This is probably driving some of you crazy. Yes, it does. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna, um, divide everything in this equation by a negative 8. I knew that 16 doesn't go into 40 so that's why I kind of scaled down to eight, a negative 8. And I, I did negative 8 because I like this um, squared term to be positive so I can factor it if it factors. I might have to do the quadratic formula in which I would like that to be positive anyway. So. 0 equals 2t squared minus 5t and then we, we did this over here so this gives me minus 12. Okay, So does this factor I'm going to go 2 times 12 which is 24 and I see a negative there. Are there factors of 24 that subtract to give me 5? 1, 24, 2, 12, 3, 8, 4, 6. Yes, 3 and 8 have a difference of 5. So that means this can be factored. Um, I draw factors of 2, 1 and 2. I draw factors of 12. 1, 12, 2, 6, 3, 4. I draw a big X. I'm going to go ahead and use those factors. 1 and 2. And then I'm trying to go across the lines to get 3 and 8. So 1 times, I don't see an 8 there, but I see 1 times 3, so I have to go with this. And then we put the 4 there. So 1 times 3, 2 times 4. So 1 times 3 is 3, and 2 times 4 is 8. Now I'm going to adjust for the sign. I need a negative 5, so that's a negative 8, positive 3. Negative 8 positive 3. This is called the big X and this is how I factor things using the big X. So this gives me X minus 4, 2X plus 3. So you can see the X, 1X minus 4, 2X plus 3. Um, but except I'm using T's. So now I'm going to move back up here. And so I have just factored this. This is 0 equals T minus 4 and then this is 2t plus 3. I'm going to set each of those factors equal to 0. The first one gives me t equals 4 and the second one gives me if you set 2t plus 3 equal to 0 it's going to be t equals negative 3 halves. 
Okay. Since we are starting the time right when we throw the stone up, we are going to cross that one out. And they ask, when does the stone strike the ground? We would say, after four seconds. What does that look like on the graph? It's right there at four. So I was hoping you weren't going to remember that's what the graph looked like. But I mean, when you do your homework, you're not going to have the graph. And it might not always be a nice integer. Um, there is the time, four seconds. And I know that's small font, but there's a four there. That is when the stone hits the ground. Okay, with what velocity does the, the stone strike the ground? Okay, so now we're going to take out the velocity function. V equals negative 32 T plus 40. And what do we know about the stone striking the ground? Well, the ground is S equals 0. And this right here is t equals 4. So we're going to put t equals 4 into this equation. So we have velocity equals negative 32 times 4. 128, so this is negative 128 plus 40. So V is, we subtract 40 from that, that's going to be negative 88. But we have to put units in the correct unit, so it's a velocity, negative 88 feet per second. Now, physically, does that make sense? Um, hopefully it does. The um, stone is coming downward, and downward is a negative velocity. The initial velocity, what was the initial velocity? I forgot what it was. I don't even, I don't even have the piece of paper. Oh, it was 40 feet per second. So the initial velocity was 40. When the stone st strikes the ground, it is negative 88. Well, let's think about that. The speed, then, is the absolute value. So the speed of the velocity here is 44 feet per second, and the speed here is 88 feet per second. Why would this speed be greater than that speed? Because you threw it up at a speed, but then it had gravity to make it go faster and faster and faster and faster until it struck the ground. And so the speed here is going to be greater than the speed there. Now it's still negative 88 feet per second for the velocity. Now if you were just throwing a stone up and it was landing right on the ground you were standing on, then that would um, probably the initial speed and the, the speed that it hits the ground would be about the same. Okay, so there we have it. Let's go do that little thing that I was talking about with the what I've been doing with the cloud. I have S equals zero. And then we have um, T would then equal four. This is what we got from this page here. And V equals negative 88. We have one more question, and then we'll take a look at the graph and put some things on the graph, but we really don't need to do that part. And it's this, because they ask questions like this in the homework. On what interval or intervals is the speed increasing? Okay, so now they're, they're actually talking about the speed. But what we found out when the velocity changes from positive to negative. So we found out when the velocity changes from positive to negative, and that was where? That was at time 1.25 
seconds. And that was, um, the highest point. So think about this. Okay, so there's a person on the cliff and they throw a stone up. Notice that right before you get to the maximum height, the stone is slowing down or the speed is decreasing. So slowing down. And then what happens? Okay, so let's just draw the ground here. And then after it has velocity zero, and we did slowing down, speeding up, look at this. Then it goes, and it is speeding up. Or another way of saying speeding up is the speed is increasing. And in fact, it goes back to that velocity times acceleration. Well, the velocity here is negative and the acceleration is negative. So velocity times acceleration is positive and that would say speeding up. So on what interval or intervals, okay, time intervals, so when they when they mean this, they mean time intervals in the book. Is it speeding up? Well, it's going to be, what? It's going to involve 1.25. Is it going to be before 1.25 seconds or after? Well, it's going to be where it's speeding up, so it's going to be after. It's going to be 1.25 and then where does this end? At what second did it hit the ground? Well, we figured that one out too just recently. So this is t equals 1.25. And then this is t equals, I believe it was 4. So that's where the experiment ends. And that is when the stone is speeding up or the speed is increasing. And so that's the answer to that question there. Okay, so we are almost done. Let's just point out a few things about this graph here. Okay, so what did we get um, for some of our answers? We found out that this point right here that was when time is zero. S is 96. And you could actually see it's between 90 and 100. And the velocity is 40. You can see it's a positive velocity. The slope is positive. The graph is going up. That means positive velocity. And then over here, this is time, this is the maximum point, this was time equals 1.25 and you can see that it's like right here. The position, the highest thing that this went was 121. I'm not putting the units here, I'm just kind of showing this. And then the velocity when it reached the highest point was zero. And then right here, this is when the object hits the ground where S is zero. And that happened when T is four. So here T is four, S was zero. And the velocity, well, you're coming down. The slope of this is really negative. The velocity we found to be negative 88 without saying any units on there. So this completely gels up with what is happening when a stone is thrown off the cliff. Um, we are done with 3.6. Something that may have upset you. Where is it? It's that right there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do another factoring using the big X. Um, a lot of you, if you're good with factoring trinomials, 
you can stop the video, you're done with 3.6. But for anybody else, I'm going to do a problem where I factor using the big X. A lot of teachers, maybe your algebra teacher said this is guess and check. Or this is trial and error, and there's no guessing or trial and error with this. This is all done scientifically, mathematically, you can get this done with confidence. So I'm going to go ahead and do another one. I've got to go find the problem first. So um, some of you are going to be done with this lecture and some of you want to see how I do the big X. Okay, so this is a review of factoring a trinal meal where the first coefficient is not a 1. This is called the big X. Um, it's just a factoring technique that I kind of came up with mixing techniques together. Um, lots of teachers call this trial and error, guess and check, and it really intimidates students when teachers say that. I remember I was taught this and the um, teacher was up at the board erasing, doing more erasing than writing on the board and at the end, poof, the answer was there. And she told us we just had to think really hard and guess and check and guess and check and guess and check. So I didn't like that. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how I do a problem like this where I could be very confident whether this thing can even factor. And then also if it does factor, to be confident not to go around guessing, but to, to be systematic about doing this. So the first thing I'm going to do, step one, I'm going to multiply 6 times 15. Oh, by the way, I'm going to, this is all typed up. So in the PDFs, I will have a typewritten thing that goes for like three pages that walks you through what I'm doing right now. Some of you would prefer to just see that. Others want to hear me doing the problem. So I'm going to go 6 times 15. And when I do that, I end up getting... 90, which I'm going to write right there. Okay, so that's step one. Multiply leading coefficient by constant coefficient. Step two, list factor pairs of 90. So I always start off with like one. One times 90 is 90. Two, no. Well, yeah, two times 45. Three times 30. Four, no. Five, let's see, five times 18. Six times 15. Seven, no. Eight, I don't think so, because 80, okay, and then nine and 10. Now I picked a nasty one just to illustrate this method. So step two, list the factor pairs of 90. Step 3 is a very simple step. We could have done this earlier. Um, I'd like you to circle this last sign. This last sign is a negative. Step 4, find the factor pair here that subtracts to give you 13 or that has a difference. And this tells me subtract. Had this been a plus here, then I'd be finding the ones that add up to 13. But it says subtract. So are, do any of these factor pairs have a difference or subtract to give you 13? And the answer is yes. So I circle that. What that means is that this problem can be factored. Okay, step five, you list the factor pairs of the leading coefficient and the factor pairs of the constant. So factor pairs of 6, 1, 6, 2, 3. Factor pairs of 15, 1, 15, and then what else? 3, 5. Okay, so that's step 5. Step 6 is pretty simple. You draw a big X. So that's step 6. Step seven is the step where your teacher said guess and check. Okay, I'm gonna put four numbers 
uh, at the edges of the big X or at the ends of the big X's. Now, the line means you multiply to try to get these numbers. Now, I see 5 is a prime number, so that's the one I'm going to go for first. The question is, do I see any 5's up here? And I do. I see a 3 and a 5. So I'm going to put them right here, 3, 5. The ones on the right have to go on the right. Could they go in any order? Yeah, I could put the 5 up here and the 3 down there. Okay, so I have that there. Now, I was after the 5 here, so I'm not going to go 3 times a natural number equals 5. I'm going to go 5 times what number? 5 times 1. It has to be. 5 times 1 is 5. And so this has been determined because those guys go together. I have a 1 there and a 6 down there. And so step 7 is probably the hardest step because you have to fill in those the ends of the x's. And we have that. So we're good to go. Step 8 is the step where you're going to be putting, putting some signs on here. So we look at the original polynomial. The middle term has a coefficient of negative 13. So I want negative 13. I want those to add up to negative 13. So I'm going to put a negative on the 18 and a positive on the 5. And if you add those up, it gives you negative 13. Okay, step 9 then says go ahead and bring the positive and negative over here, always on the right-hand side. So I have a 6 times 3 is 18. I need a negative 18, so I'm going to put a negative right there. You don't want to put the negative over there. And then 1 times 5 is positive. I need a positive 5, so I'm going to put a plus right there. Okay, so that is step 9 and step 10. We're pretty much done. I'm going to circle that. Circle that. And look what I have. This gives me 1x minus 3. And then the bottom gives me 6, and then there's an x plus 5. So this is really x minus 3. We should never leave it as a 1x. And then 6x plus 5. We can multiply it back through and see if we got the right answer. 6x squared, and then we have plus 5x minus 18x. And there's the plus 5 minus 18. That gives me the negative 13x. And then this is minus 15. And so everything worked out nicely. You might be thinking to yourself, well, Joe, I don't want to do this every time I factor a trinomial when there's like a 6 or a 2 there. Um, well, after you do the big X several times, you might find yourself skipping over some or all of the steps in this algorithm. That just means you're getting really good at factoring trinomials. So for instance, you remember how I listed the factor pairs of 90? Well, had I known that I was going to be subtracting to get a 13, I might have not listed 1 and 90. I may have just thought about it in my head and wrote those ones down. So as you do more of these, you probably probably become more efficient and I think that ends our lecture for 3.6. Do your homework. Have a good day. I'll see you on the next video.